for this edition of the Locked On Sun Devils podcast. Number one friend of the podcast, replacing some of our other guys, uh, Cole Tompum from Devils Digest, will be joining us today to talk Arizona State Sun Devils football training camp. Let's hop right into it on this edition of the Locked On Sun Devils podcast. Our Locked On Sun Devils, your daily podcast on the Arizona State Sun Devils, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome back to this edition of the Locked on Sun Devils podcast. My name is Richie Bradshaw, and I will be your guide for everything Arizona State Sun Devils. As always, thank you guys so much for making us your first listen of the day. Remember, we are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube, if you would like to check us out in a visual platform. But wherever you do get those podcasts, make sure you hit like and subscribe. Turn on those notifications so you get an update every time we post new content. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season. With more odds, props, and lines than ever before, Bet Online, where the game starts. I am joined by my friend Cole Tompum over at Devil's Digest. Cole, thank you so much for making some time for us to talk some training camp because I know you've been out there and we're excited to pick your brain today. Yeah, of course. I'm I'm not sure if like my sunburn on my neck shines through on the video <laughs> right now, but like, yeah, that's the real proof where you can tell I've I've been out there. But man, like these fall camp practices have been so fun and the energy like just from the players and, and being out there and, and seeing like that physical chip on their shoulder as they go through their skill work and 11 on 11, like it is truly a blessing to, to do what I do and be able to, to, to share that with everyone else. Absolutely, man. And for the people who don't know, Cole is part of the Walter Cronkite uh, school of journalism over with Arizona state. So, I mean, if you're looking for a guy who's pretty in touch it's Cole. Like I said, he's with Devil's Digest as well, so make sure you check out all his content. Follow him on Twitter. We will go through where to get all the content at the end of the podcast for you guys. Let's go ahead and hop into the conversation today as we're talking about training camp updates. Cole, I want to talk first on the offense, and we're going to address the elephant in the room, so to speak, <laughs> but it's a very good elephant. It's not like an awkward elephant, and that's the quarterback situation. So, I know the other day you were talking about how Emory Jones has looked really, really good in camp. I know that you had put out there that he had had one of the better camps of any of the quarterbacks or one of the better practices and that he really stands out. So what is Emory doing that's really kind of placing him ahead of the rest of the competition? Yeah, I would say he didn't really separate himself until this last practice and it was just a firestorm um, in the seven on it started in the seven on a seven session and then kind of snowballed into that second 11 on 11 session. Um, you know, on, on Wednesday, it was, it was more run work in the first 11 on 11 session. So you can't really knock them too much because the defensive line under coach Rodriguez is obviously so solid, you know, so, you know, well integrated into what he's doing there, but yeah, it was just a barrage of missiles, and it seemed like there was a touchdown every other play. I saw the ball just getting out quick. He dotted up pretty much all of his receivers. I mean, I'll, I'll list them out right now. Conyers, Swenson, Cam Johnson got two scores. Andre Johnson got in there. Uh, Giovanni Sanders had a, had a couple scores as well, including an incredible toe-tapping um, touchdown that – the officials had to, you know, get together and confirm for around, you know, a couple seconds before they actually gave the signal for for a touchdown. And Charles Hall, um, I don't know if I said Chad Johnson Jr., but I mean, all of those pass catchers scored, and it was really just a, a breakthrough moment for the offense. I think really showed, you know, Emory's poise and just ability to bounce back because he actually led the group in interceptions, the quarterbacks in, in interceptions through the four, first four practices. And then just to be able to have that explosion just shows the type of leader and type of poise that he has. And that poise was pretty evident at media day. It was his first time talking to the, to the, to the Valley's media. And you could just see the, just the poise from all the sec cameras pointed at him when he was at Florida, um, the pressure of having to go up against that type of, of opponent every single week. He just has it, man. He, he looks like a mature leader that the room really needs to, in order to 
bring this team together. Dude, that's awesome to hear is one of the things that like maybe worried some of the, maybe, maybe the casual fans or some of the media admittedly was that Emery Jones was a late addition through the transfer portal. He missed the spring practices and everything. So it felt like, you know, he might have been, quote unquote, like behind the eight ball in terms of the competition with Paul Tyson and with Trenton Borgay, who got a lot of the first team snaps. But now that Emery has settled in, I mean, that's very good news for people who don't know. uh, Emery Jones was one of the most like competent passers in the SEC when it came to playing against the Blitz. If Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, I believe PFF said he had the best pass rating in the SEC, and if not, he was one of the five best guys when playing against the Blitz. So this is a very con- confident guy when it comes to throwing the football. It's awesome to see that he's you know, showing that off again, and I love to hear that he's spreading the ball around to a lot of the guys who are going to be getting new opportunities. There's nothing that makes me more excited than Chad Johnson. Let's... Honestly, like I've I've been waiting for him to break out for quite some time. Yeah, I mean him and Elijah Badger is roommate as well. Like it just seems like the right people are in the receiving room. Um, Charles Hall is a guy that's been you know making a highlight catch every other practice, and it really does feel like they have the right people in in, in just all position aspects this year to kind of overcome the perception of the team that's plagued them this off season so far um you know maybe they're not the most experienced in terms of snaps or production but like the drive the work ethic um the way players carry themselves at practice it really does seem like it's it's better for the team this fall and again that's like super awesome to hear i know there was a lot of concern about the receiving core you lost five players to the transfer portal, including your top two guys with Ricky Pearsall and, L- and uh, LV Bunkley Shelton transferring to big name programs. Funny enough, Ricky Pearsall goes to Florida and Emory Jones comes from Florida. And Bunkley Shelton there. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. And Bunkley Shelton goes to Oklahoma. And there were some, there were some it, admittedly like viable and justifiable concerns with just the lack of experience. Andre Johnson really, kind of disappeared down the stretch of last season. Uh, Brian Thompson was not anywhere close to what we had anticipated being the deep threat and the yards after catch guy. He was at Utah. He was a uh, 20 yards per catch guy and he goes down to a flat 10 yeah, big play threat. Yeah, he was. And he just wasn't able to get going, but he's back this year. I have been very, very high on cam Johnson What's your overall opinion of, of a receiving core that is going through a just massive makeover right now? Yeah, it's definitely been a transition. I will say it, it helps, you know, having people that have been with the program for a while, like Elijah Badger, like Chad Johnson Jr., um, Andre Johnson as well, that maybe haven't gotten necessarily the most opportunity in last year's scheme but they're expected to kind of be a a bedrock for, for this year. Um, But it has been exciting to see the integration of Cam Johnson and Charles Hall, how well they've been able to mesh immediately in Glenn Thomas's offense and, you know, just showcase what they can do. Um, Even Zeke Freeman uh, has been, uh, has had his spark plays at practice where he can showcase that speed and Charles Hall. He also has some speed, but he is well-built man chiseled just ready to produce in this offense if given the opportunity. I'm personally excited a lot about the potential of these receiving tight ends because while they did lose Bunkley Shelton and Pearsaw to the to the transfer portal, the Sun Devils gained those athletic tight ends, and it was clear like the coaching staff had a blueprint for this offseason. They wanted to make the tight end position something opponents had to worry about. And you add Messiah Swinson into the room, Bryce Pierre, um, Jalen Conyers obviously carries over from last season, had a touchdown against Utah. But these guys are are big, athletic, can catch the ball. Um, and I think it's it's probably likely one of these guys leads the team in touchdowns. Um, and Swenson especially, I think, has probably been the most targeted receiver through five practices. Love to, love to hear that the tight ends might be getting a little more involved last year. I feel like it was 
not a high priority last year to get Curtis Hodges a little more involved in the offense. He did have some drop issues. I know he had one drop that actually led to an interception. I can't remember who it was against, but I think he did have like one catch that turned into a fumble against BYU as well. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure. So there were some security issues. And I think that's also a testament to him, you know, kind of being more of a project at the position. Like he didn't have like a true switch until the COVID year he had four games where yeah, he had like one seam route touchdown. And last year was his true full year at the position. And it just seems like there were some inconsistencies there that came with just being more comfortable, you know, playing the position and, and, and being like that receiving tight end threat. Right. And I am admittedly like very, very excited for Jalen Conyers this year. I feel like he's a big time breakout candidate, but it's, it's also really good to hear that Messiah Swenson is standing out. I know when we brought him in, Everyone was saying like, oh, you know, he's basically a power forward when it comes to the end zone area. He's somewhere between 6'6 and 6'8, depending on if you're using college height or using, (laughs) yeah, you love that stuff, dude. I remember Jalen Strong was 6'5 in college, and then he Mm -hmm. gets to the combine, he's 6'2. But you love to hear that he is that athletic specimen that we've heard about and that he could potentially be that big post-up guy in the end zone, and you just kind of toss it up and let him come down with it. So, obviously, based on what you're saying, I would assume that you're in the camp that the tight ends are going to be a lot more involved this year? Yeah, definitely. I, I'm super excited. I wrote an article about how 12 personnel could really be you know, a, a savior for the Sun Devils this year, and also better prepare them for teams like Utah who do exercise that 12 personnel um, 22 personnel um, much you know more often than any of the other opponents that they'll face and that's why I think when Utah travels to Sun Devil Stadium like ASU might play them better this year simply because they're facing 12 personnel a lot more in, in practice we also talked to fullback Case Hatch you know about you know two running backs two tight ends and I think I'm excited for Hatch this season as well because this is kind of like his his NFL linchpin season and how he can, you know, raise his draft stock and, you know, Hatch, he, he's just, he's such a talent. He, he loves blocking people. He loves hitting people. And especially with the run game being the focal point of the ASU offense, probably once again, like it, it's just excited. It, it's, it's exciting to see what he can do as a lead blocker for Zazavian Valley and uh, Daniel and Ghana. Speaking of that ground game, how's it looking so far? There's, there is some pretty good hype around it. Yeah, you lose Rashad White and you lose Chip Traynum uh, to the to the NFL draft and to Ohio State respectively. But I am again like talking about guys I'm very excited about. Daniel Nagata is is a player that I'm very high on. I think Zavian Balade can take that Rashad White role as the main pass catcher in the backfield. I think Deontay Elliott is in for a more important season than people realize. Tevin White and George Hart. Mm-hmm. could also be highly involved. So thoughts on the run game? How's that looked in training camp so far? Yeah, I think Iguano or Co- Coach Iguano has done a very good job of, once again, crafting a well-rounded backfield where any of those members can come in in a situation and produce. Um, I do think like there's going to be a pretty clear distinction um, between Zavian Valade, Daniel Ngata, and then George Hart and Tevin White vying for, you know, some of those pace role duties um, to come in and, and help, you know, take the load off of those two main guys. But I'm excited to see what Ngana can do because he was kind of reserved for like a spark play pinch hitter role last season. And even Coach Warren was saying like, shame on me. He was so productive in, in those situations that maybe we should have played him more. Obviously with Rashad White in the backfield, that's kind of hard to do. Um, but I, I was impressed with Ngata's poise and, and how to he, how he can come in there and provide those spark plays. And I do think he's going to be used a little bit more in the receiving game than uh, Zazavian Valde, who, you know, X Factor, that's his nickname. And X, he, he brings a bruising, you know, hard hitting style, get the tough yards. Um, and I think there is that comfort between him and Emery Jones in that backfield already, where those two have a pretty good relationship. Um, and I think X will be also help out more in a a pass protection role, um, which honestly ASU didn't 
didn't utilize much last season because Rashad White was so, so valuable as a receiver. I mean, he led the team in receiving last season. So it's going to be a, a different look to the backfield this year, but I still think there's going to be a lot of production from those guys. One more question before we hop into our first break. The offensive line is also going through a lot of change. You mm-hmm. lost guys to the transfer portal. You lose Kellen Deesh and Donovan West to the NFL. You did hold on to Ladarius Henderson. I think that's a very – very important aspect. You're going to be moving uh, Ben Scott inside the center. You bring in Des Holmes and you bring in uh, uh, Emmett Bully. You have Isaiah Glass, who's hopefully going to be stepping into that role. How's the offensive line holding up against, as you mentioned a little earlier, a very good defensive line? Yeah, we've been watching those those one-on-ones, those inside zone run work, and it's been getting pretty chippy between those guys. And I will say, you know, the defensive line is it's pretty solid at this point, and they're winning a, a majority of those reps. But like you said, the offensive line does have those leaders like Henderson. He's he's really stepped up in, you know, just putting the team on his back and being a face of the program. And I think that really bodes well for the rest of the O-line. Like if Henderson is the example to follow, then it's it's pretty easy to see, you know, the, the path to – to the path to consistent play. So I think there's still a lot of moving pieces there. Like the starters are still getting a little bit solidified. And obviously there's, there's so many, there's so much chemistry still to develop between those guys. And I think, you know, we'll, we'll see what type of offensive line ASU has heading into conference play after they finish up their third game of the season. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that still water game against Oklahoma state, I think is going to be the, the true test see if they can hold up against against that pass rush. That is going to be a very, very uh, stressful game, to put yes. it lightly. Yeah, going to Stillwater is already difficult enough when you have to reload and rebuild the way that Arizona State has had to, and knowing that Oklahoma State is primed to compete for the Big 12 again, it's, it's going to be a tough game. Preseason number 11 team in the country, I believe. Yeah, they're, they're a very, very well-built program. Uh, Let's go ahead and hop into our first break. When we return, we're going to switch to the other side of the football and talk about the defensive side and everything that's been going on there. This is the Locked on Sun Devils podcast. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. BetOnline continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in-game betting, sports, scores, podcasts. They have you all covered. Head to BetOnline today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. BetOnline, where the game starts. As always, thank you guys so much for making the Locked on Sun Devils your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all platforms. All right, Cole, heading into our second conversation now, looking at the defensive side of the ball. Let's just start with what we kind of have briefly touched on a little bit already, and that's the defensive line. You lose Jermaine Lola, you lose Tyler Johnson and DJ Davidson, but man, does it feel like you have some very good depth up front. What's your overall thoughts? Yeah, that's exactly my take, and that's exactly Coach Rodriguez's take. He said the other day he feels like he has eight solid guys that he can count on up front, and that depth just allows you so much freedom um, to work with, especially with defensive coordinator Donnie Henderson. He wants to get back to the blitz a little bit more, be, be aggressive up front, and really accelerate that clock of, of these quarterbacks. And I think you see a leaner Merlin Robertson – um, Kyle Soley right by his side, and then even Connor Soley. You got that brother chemistry between those two. Uh, I think we're going to see them hunting quarterbacks a lot more this season, which I'm excited for, especially for Merlin, um, because the production really hasn't been there on the sack and pressure side for him since his freshman season. He's been ASU has really largely used their linebackers in a in a coverage role, and that's been great. I mean, it got Darian Butler a uh, undrafted free agent tryout with the Raiders and he's been doing stellar things there but I think creating pressure on these quarterbacks is important and with Donnie Henderson at the helm he wants to really get back to that so I mean back to the defensive line the biggest concerns were about the interior of the defensive line especially you mentioned Jermaine Lole leaving but 
Omar Norman Lott has been locked in. That dude is arriving, been the first guy in the door every single practice, I believe. And uh, especially last season, sack leader BJ Green right behind him. Um, those are two different players. Obviously, BJ Green, more on the smaller, um, you know, speed dominant players. Omar's got, you know, pretty violent hands, a lot of power to him. But you just you look at that three technique spot and you just can't be not be excited about the potential of those guys, especially, you know, them heading into their second full season. And that was something I was going to bring up is uh, Norman Lott had initially placed himself in the transfer portal, mm-hmm. but ended up deciding to come back and tweeting something along the lines of like family is sticking together when times are getting rough. Yep. He had mentioned in some press conferences that coach Rodriguez was one of the biggest reasons that he wanted to come back was to continue honing his skill. And there was a lot of great flashes that he had shown last year. I think he's going to be, a very important piece of the defensive line this year. Looking at the defensive ends between like Joe Moore and Michael Mattis and uh, some of the other guys, uh, Pesifi, I feel like I just don't pronounce that right. <laughs> but there, there's a lot of intriguing talent on the defensive end side as well. Do you think that that's going to be something that's not so much easily replaceable, but when you had a guy like Tyler Johnson who was – so steady at that position uh, consistently for a couple of years. What's your overall thought? Obviously, Michael Mattis being the most uh, tenured guy on that defensive line. Yeah, I mean, there's de- there's definitely like a transition phase at that right defensive end spot, which Tyler, you know, held for the last two seasons. But I think you feel good about Anthony Cooper um, because, you know, that was Rodriguez – yeah, Rodriguez said Cooper created the most quarterback pressures last season. So he wasn't a guy that necessarily showed up in the in the sack column, but he was, you know, doing his work outside of the outside of the box score, right? And then behind him, you have Trev, Trevez Moore returning from an ACL injury suffered against BYU last season. And Trevez, he's one of the most bendy athletic guys I've ever seen with my own eyes. Like the way he can move, the way he can uh his lower body flexibility, it's, it's just different. And to see him progressing well in that rehab from that injury during spring, he was just pacing around the defensive line, like a cage line, like he couldn't wait to get back into the swing of things. Now that he is into the swing of things, you can see that, that fire um, and, and just all those intangibles that got the coaching staff so excited for his potential, um, you know, last season before he had his season ended prematurely. And then when you talk about Michael Matus, like that, that guy is just intelligent. Um, he's, he's ad- ad- basically been adopted into the system and he's just reliable. Um, so he needs to see a little bit more results this season, but I think part of that just comes with that comfort of, of this is third, the third year in Rodriguez's system. You trust the process and you trust Rodriguez to, you know, put you in a position to make plays. Trevez Moore, I got to talk to him. He seems very determined to come back this year. One of the goals that he had mentioned to me on the podcast was that he wants to break Terrell Suggs' sack record. That's about as high a goal as you can set for yourself. Mm -hmm. He looked so, so good in those three games that he got to play last year. I thought the twitchy, athletic specimen that he was, he knew how to convert speed to power and bend the edge. Is that still there, or do you think he is going to take a little bit of a step back coming back from a major injury? No, I, I think from all signs, like he's been practicing skill work without the brace, and then when it's time for team period, time for 11 on 11, he puts back on the brace. So, um, you know, the biggest thing with coming back from an ACL, you see it with Joe Burrow as well. He wasn't trusting that knee as much in, in the preseason, and it affected his play. I think – just coming back from that major injury, it's it's all about – it's less about the strength of the knee and more about trusting that knee to, to do everything that you want it to do, right? Um, and I think that's where Trevez is in this process, is is more the trust phase. Um, I think most of the rehab is, is done with. It's just all about getting comfortable again. But, I mean, Rodriguez, he, he, he mentions it all the time with Trevez. Like, it, he sees the same things we do 
um, what you just mentioned, like the flexibility, the athleticism, the speed to power, it's mostly about dialing in the little things, the technique, um, you know, like the spacing when, when you bend around that outside shoulder uh, of the offensive tackle. It, it's about those little things in order to maximize your production. And I think that's, that's where Trevez is, is still learning, and we'll, we'll see what a year in, uh, under Rodriguez will do for him. Very exciting prospect to just hopefully put together a full season. Moving back to into the defensive interior, BJ Green was a guy who paced the team in sacks last year. Definitely came al- alive down the stretch. He, if if my memory serves, he had a very good game against a pretty solid Wisconsin offensive line in the Las Vegas Bowl. What's he doing in camp? Because he's going to have some stiff competition to get those snaps with. Nesta Jade Silvera coming in to play the nose tackle spot. You still have Omar Norman Lott. There's a few other guys on the interior as well who are going to be competing for the snaps. Is BJ Green going to be able to get on the field enough to really take that next step, at least in terms of production from what he did last year? Yeah, I think I think he will. It might be a little bit ambitious to, to say he's going to lead the team in sacks again because I think – like the, the DNs are going to have a little bit more production this season, but I, I love BJ green style of play. And when he came into fall camp last year, you could tell like this guy was well above any walk on that, that Rodriguez, or I guess any, any normal defensive line walk on um, he, he had that sense of speed to him um, just bull rush power. And it was, once again, it was about dialing in the little things, the technique and getting lined up and, and just maxim putting yourself in a position to succeed, really. And Rodriguez, he would make it a point to like get on BJ every single practice and about s- some little thing that he was doing because he believed in his potential so much. And that belief eventually paid off in the, in the form of the team's sack leader. So I will say BJ has been a little bit more quiet, and that's mostly because you know, Omar Norman Lott has showed out and and – that that sense of focus and and just consistency is so prevalent with with Omar, um, but I do think he's going to be rotated in pretty frequently. And he was part of last year's third down speed package. Coach Rodriguez says he wants a lot, you know, more of those packages that he can put in. So I, I think you'll see plenty of BJ Green this season. I would absolutely love that. Moving to the next level of the defense. There's not as many questions here with the established guys of Merlin Robertson and Kyle Soley, but you lost Darian Butler and you lost Eric Gentry, who Mm. I anticipated was going to take a massive role this year. Do you expect that there's going to be a lot of the base defense with three linebackers on the field, or do you think there's going to be more like nickel packages where Jordan Clark gets on the field and you're kind of running more with just Robertson and Soley plus a 4D lineman up front? We have seen a lot of creative nickel packages, I will say, this fall and even in the spring. Um, actually, maybe not as much in the spring because Gentry was still there. But I think you feel good about the chemistry between those guys because obviously Kyle Sully and Merlin Robinson have spent a lot of time playing next to each other. And you know, having your brother right next to you in, in Kyle Sully's case, um, I think that just does wonders for – for that chemistry, for that connection and, and being communicative. And I, I don't think we'll see a too tremendous drop off in terms of what those players are supposed to do and, and filling their run gaps and dropping in the, their hook curl zones and coverage. Like it, it looks pretty automatic so far. And I think you can expect more of the same from, from that trio. Who would be the next linebacker to take on that role next to next to Soli and next to Robertson, would you be going with Kyle's brother or would you be looking at a couple of the other younger guys as well? Yeah, I think at the, at the weak side linebacker spot, you'd probably be looking at Connor Soli, but next up in the lineup, I feel like Will Schaefer has impressed me a lot just because I think he has the defense down. He knows what he's supposed to do. He's vocal in relaying adjustments, um, and just communicating across the entire defense when the offense makes its adjustments and sends players into motion. Um, that's what's impressed me a lot about Schaefer. And so I think he's probably the next guy on the field if, if one of those three 
one of those starting three needs a breather. But I think it's it's pretty much set in stone that who's going to be starting is going to be Kyle Soley, Connor, and Merlin Robertson. Looking at the secondary, their their uh, it, common story is you have a lot of guys to replace. <laughs> pretty much replacing your entire starting secondary short of Jordan Clark and the nickel. You lose both your safeties with DeAndre Pierce and Evan Fields running out of eligibility. Uh, Chase Lucas and Jack Jones now in the NFL. And Tommy Hill transferring to Nebraska. Now, Tamarcus, Tamarcus Davis is back. It feels like he's a lock for one of the outside corner spots. Yep. Who looks like is going to get the other spot across from him, assuming that Jordan Clark is pretty much a lock for that nickel spot? Yeah, we've seen a lot of Mason Williams, and he filled in you know, coincidentally when Tamarcus Davis was out uh, last season for the first couple of games. He filled in, and I thought he did a pretty you know good job um, given that he was a freshman as well. So we've, we're seeing a lot of Mason Williams, and even Mason Williams will go into the slot when they have Jordan Clark lined up at safety. So there's just a lot of flexibility with this secondary. And I will say with the with the safeties in particular, in having to replace DeAndre Pierce and Evan Fields, they brought in two transfers, Corey Bethley and Chris Edmonds, two you know rangy opportunistic safeties, and they've been quiet through the first like five practices. And to me, that's a good thing. That means there's no big plays where like the help was late over the top, um, nothing slipping through the cracks. And that's just a testament to how well those guys integrated in the spring. And then, you know, the following summer got the chance to really cement themselves within the lineup. Um, so I, I'm not saying like Kiwan Markham is the odd man out here. Cause I, I still think, you know, Kiwan offers the same thing a lot of those other guys offer in, in terms of length and, and ball skills, but you feel a lot better about your safeties and, and your, your back half of that secondary than you did, um, you know, in the off season. Looking at the safety spot, I feel like there's some pretty good competition back there with the other Markham brother Keon. You have Chris Edmonds and Corey Bethley, the latter of the two who I'm absolutely just totally smitten for considering his production that he had at Hawaii for what it's worth with Todd Graham, former Arizona state head coach. And then you, you've got some other guys that you're going to try and get in the shuffle as well. Who do you think if you, if you had to make a prediction for the starting two safeties by the time that week one rolls around against NAU, who are the two who stand out the most to you? I think I think probably Kiwan Markham and Chris Edmonds, mostly just because I think they offer a type of of length that hasn't really been seen there in previous seasons. And especially uh, Chris, he was such an opportunistic safety at, at Sanford. I think he had like eight interceptions over his career there. And so being able to like cherry pick the ball, um, and and be a, be the heartbreaker for your opponent's offense is is so valuable in creating turnovers, and that's you know what ASU thrived at last season was being able to put a stop to those drives and and put their offense in a good position to to basically run the clock out and score. So that would that was that would be my initial stab at predicting who's going to start at safety, but. It's, it's a similar situation to defensive line where I think there's there's just a lot of depth and a lot of different personnel packages that you can throw these guys into. Like if you want a, a le- more length towards the boundary side of the field, then you'll go with six foot three Ro Torrance and um, you know six two Chris Edmonds. And then on the field side, you'll have you know some of your more athletic guys. You'll put Mason Williams, you know Jordan Clark, and and Corey Bethley there, right? And so that way you you have a, play, a lot of players that can cover a lot of ground on that side. So I think Donnie Henderson, Aaron Fletcher, they're going to get super creative in, in how they deploy this secondary. And, you know, similar to, to previous seasons, like no one's really a, a, a newcomer at ASU, like a, a guy that is expected a red shirt. Um, that's just not the way this defense does things. They expect their players to contribute in some some capacity and just do their job. Yeah, there definitely is a lot of guys to replace 
in that secondary, but it also feels like there's a lot of intriguing guys who can step in and end up contributing big time roles because you do have a lot of guys like Edmonds and like Bethley who are productive when it comes to turnovers. You have a lot of size with uh, mm-hmm. Row Torrance being 6'3 to 6'4. You have Tamarcus Davis is over six foot. Right. You've got Chris Edmonds again is like 6'2 or 6'3. There's a lot of intriguing like talent. There's a lot of intriguing body types and athleticism that is going to be a fascinating storyline to be monitoring over this season. Let's go ahead and head into our final break. When we return, we're going to get Cole's final thoughts on everything about the upcoming season. This is the Locked on Sun Devils podcast. And we are back for our final segment. As always, thank you guys for making for making us your first listen of the day. Make your second listen of the day locked on Pac-12. Hosted by my good friend Spencer McLaughlin. Get all of your Pac-12 news in 30 minutes or less. Just like Locked on Sun Devils, it's free and available on all platforms. Cole, not going to keep you too much longer here. Taking a look at the team overall, what are your thoughts? Do you feel pretty confident despite all the replacements? Do you think this is going to be a very long and maybe difficult year? Are you kind of lukewarm halfway in between? Just overall thoughts. Yeah, I think if, if we're starting with the concern side, right, on both sides of the ball, I think primary concerns are offensive line and your linebacker, linebacker depth. Because with the linebackers, you feel good about that starting trio, um, and we, you know we've talked about Soli and, and Robertson and and what they offer and, and how consistent they are, um, and you, you, that decreases as you go down the lineup. And especially, I think there's only six like scholarship linebackers on the roster, so definitely one of the thinnest positions on the team. Um, so you know you you pray for like no injuries there and and situations where you're going to have to find a way to to make something work. And with the offensive line, it's it's more about that that unit's chemistry, right, and how they gel together, um, how they're able to communicate, and that's just not something that we're gonna have a very accurate picture of until you know the the pads come on and they start facing off against you know real real opponents. So I think those would be my my concerns there. I've been kind of looking towards the schedule and being like, man, that like opening slate of conference games just looks super tough, and that yeah, is yeah. really gonna like define the mentality of this team and and how well they can adapt to adversity because they weren't particularly good at doing that last season. Mm -hmm. It was definitely a frustrating year last year because it just felt like you played one half of football. I mean, Utah, you were, you were kicking their tail in the first half and then you got shut out in the second half and it was a very frustrating. It just felt like they couldn't put, 60 minutes together for an entire game. Hopefully that changes a little bit this year. Looking at the offense, what is the biggest strength that you've noticed and anticipate to be the biggest strength for the majority of 2022? Yeah, I'm going to just go with my earlier answer in the the pass catching tight ends. Like Glenn Thomas knows it. I know it. To the casual fan, you see a, a six seven tight end in the slot and you're like, that's an obvious mismatch right there. Um, you have obvious mismatches in Jalen Conyers and Messiah Swinson and how you can deploy them and how you can get them into space. I think a large key, key to the Sun Devils season is how often can we can we go to those guys and can they force the defense you know, to pay more attention to them so we can get other playmakers involved. Defensively, what would you say is the biggest strength uh, heading into the year? and more than likely to be the biggest strength for the majority of 2022. I mean, probably Rodriguez's defensive line and and that Wolf pack and just how they operate. Like it's, it's been the most consistent unit in terms of, um, you know, players buying into the system and, and, and really like forming those connections and helping each other. Like you, you feel like those guys from a chemistry standpoint are, are really locked in and, and believe in their potential. And I think that's, that's a really dangerous thing to have when, when you 
believe in yourself so much. Like it's almost like the results are expected, you know, this year. So there's just, there's such a variety of, of playmakers and, and fresh newcomer talent like Robbie Harrison, Blaze and Lona Wong. Uh, he had a, a pick, a handful of pressures and at least two sacks, I think through his first four collegiate practices. So there, there's just a lot of talent to get excited about in the defensive line room. I think this year we're actually, we're really going to see some actionable results from a pressure and, and quarterback sack standpoint from those guys up front. One of the spots we didn't talk about is the special teams. Looking at the kickers, there's a lot of question marks there. I feel pretty confident that Eddie Zablicki is going to take that next step forward. I thought he was honestly one of the strengths of the team last year. I thought that he was pretty dang solid as a freshman. But Christians and Dejas, not there. And Logan Tyler, not there. Mm -hmm. You have Jace Feely, the son of longtime NFL ki uh, kicker Jay Feely, and you have – is it Carter Brown? It is. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I was going to say I'm, I I was just making sure I didn't have someone else mixed up. Who is standing out between between Brown and Feely right now? No, I don't really think there is too much separation between those guys. Okay. I think the the kicking – from the, from a kicking standpoint, those guys started off camp kind of slow. Um, I think they only made like – three of eight on the first day but they oh. made six of eight at last practice and okay. especially carter like he was missing kind of the you know the more closer kicks he, he was missing like some 30 35 yarders and then as he extended his range he started making those and he had like plenty of leg to spare as well so it, i think that's more of just uh you getting into the rhythm of of things and and you know becoming you know, the getting adjusted to that student athlete regimen and and obviously like Feely has been there longer, so he's been a little bit more consistent. But yeah, I would say that's that's definitely a battle to watch. Um, I'm not too particularly ready to assign a winner there, um, but to to see like you know the potential of Carter Brown's leg has been cool to watch because he has dra drained some 45 45 plus yard field goals in practice. That'll be another very stressful position battle to watch probably throughout the season unless one of these guys is able to just lock it down early in the year. DJ Taylor, very, yep. very frustrating. The decision-making that he had last year showed a lot of talent as a freshman. He had some ball, uh, ball security issues last year as well, though. Is he looking better? I know he changed his number, and we're we're thinking maybe that's the magic touch to get back to the upside he showed as a freshman. What's he looking like right now? I mean, personally, in my opinion, the single digit makes him look faster. Yes. And, I mean, that, that speed isn't going anywhere. Like 109 yards right to the house, like it just shows you the potential he has, and it, it really will lie in that decision-making and – I know I've seen DJ be in the back of the end zone with um, receivers coach, you know, Bobby Wade back there saying like, make good decisions, make good decisions. And he's let a couple of balls trickle through the back of the end zone and receive praise for that. So, you know, I think it, DJ kind of got a little, little white and white in the eyes and um, wanting to, wanting to take one back and really make a difference for his team, especially when ASU was playing from behind, last season and i think we're, we're going to see a, a little bit more level-headedness to him um this fall great to hear especially because i don't know if there's too much competition behind him i don't know if anyone has stood out outside of dj taylor has there been anyone by chance or is it really like dj taylor's role pretty much by himself yeah i think he's definitely the first guy taking kickoff returns and I think the first guy off the punt return as well, but I think you you will see Charles Hall mixed in that punt return game. Uh, I think Daniel Ngata has been back there for some touches as well, but obviously if he's going to have a larger role in the backfield, then the less hits you want him taking, the better. Final question for you. I don't know if you have put a lot of thought into this, so I am putting you on the spot a little bit here. If you had to make a prediction, not including a bowl game for a final record for Arizona State, what are you kind of thinking? Like I said, I don't know if you put a lot of thought into this, but 
again, not including the bowl game, just out of out of the twelve games, seven and five, six and six, mm-hmm. whatever, whatever your fancy is, what would be your prediction? I think right now a, a six win season is is where I'm I'm leaning towards. Like this this start to the season is so tough with having to go on the road and face Oklahoma State, and and then right after you know your what would ideally be a cupcake cupcake game against Eastern Michigan, Utah, USC, and Washington, and two of those games I, at least two of those games are at home, but it's just a, a tough start to the season. Um, so you would hope to maybe steal one of those games, but you're still like best case scenario, the Sun Devils go into the bye week sitting at 500, I feel like. So I think six games is reasonable with the potential for for some upsets if this team does surprise down the stretch. I think six and six is probably the most realistic. I I wouldn't be surprised if they were one game under 500. I wouldn't be surprised if they're one game over 500. Right. I, I think they're a team that's just got a lot of changes coming on. But that'll wrap up this episode. So, Cole, thanks for hopping on. Where can the listeners find you and all of your content? Yeah, you can find my work at Devil's Digest. That's where all my Arizona State articles are. Um, got some good stuff on there, some film breakdowns. Um, you know, some, some player features that I'm proud of. So yeah, stay tuned to devil's digest and you can reach me personally on Twitter at ham analysis. Um, that's where you can find all the practice updates. So next time Emory Jones starts lighting up <laughs> it, the, the red zone, I'll have updates. Perfect. That's what I love to hear. And you guys know, you can find me as well on Twitter at Richie Bratz 36, follow, follow me for all the content, follow the podcast at L O underscore sun devils. And that'll wrap up this edition. So until next time, guys, you keep it locked right here on Locked on Sun Levels.